there was an issue with the Fibonacci sequence. And here is the code from last time. Dots. It's mostly innocuous, right? It's like, this is a base case, this is uh, two base cases. Recursive case, add fib of n plus 1 to fib of n minus 2, or fib of n minus 1 to fib of n minus 2, because it's just like, this element of the sequence is the sum of the two previous ones. That's standard recursive case, that makes sense. And it'll work, like this code will calculate fib of 7 just fine. 13, but fib of 100, it will never finish in our lifetimes, in our children's lifetimes, in our children's children's lifetimes, etc. There's an issue going on, so let's let's un unpack that because it's a little tricky, and this is uh, something you'll get good at in 41 if you take that. So we are repeating so much work when we call these Fibonacci functions. So fib of five, for example, we just called fib of five. It's I wouldn't even dream of drawing fib of seven right now. But if we call fib of five, what does it have to do? It has to send off work to go and calculate fib of four and fib of three, right? Because that's the recursive case. It needs both of those answers. So it goes off and calls this. And then once that's done, it goes off and it calls this. And then it adds the two answers. That's how it's working. So fib of five must call necessarily fib of four and fib of three. That is a four. Let me just redraw that. Fib of four and fib of three. So, and then we're in the base case, like fib of 4, we haven't even thought about fib of 3 yet. Fib of 4 is working on itself, and it's hitting the recursive case. It's going to call fib of 3 and fib of 2 so they can get those answers back and add the result. That's its answer. So fib of 4 must go off and call fib of 3 and fib of 2. Interesting. Uh, and then fib of 3, again, is going to go off and call fib of 2 and fib of 1 and add up those. You see where I'm going with this? Fib of 2 and fib of 1. Add those up. Fib of 2 is still the recursive case. It'll go off and call fib of 1 and add that to fib of 0 to calculate that. So it needs to go and make its two recursive calls separately. Fib of 1 and fib of 0. And those are finally base cases. Those will immediately give the answers back. We don't have to draw any more uh, depth to this. So fib of 1 will also give an answer back, but again, fib of 2 over here, when that gets called, it has to again call fib of 1 and fib of 0, because it's a separate call, all right? And then again, like fib of 3, you get the idea now, it's going to go off and it's going to call fib of 2 and add that to fib of 1. That one's the base case, but fib of 2 has to go and call fib of 1 and fib of 0. So there, then we're down to the base cases, all right? So notice how... All this work over here was duplicated over here, first of all. Here is how many times we hit the base case. It's a lot of times. Some more over there, too. That's disgusting. Do we see a problem? Do we see the problem? It's like this entire, like, look at how many times I'm calling fib of 2. It's just like forgetting about that it got the answer before. It doesn't know. These are separate calls, like fib of 2, another fib of 2 over here, another fib of 2 crazy. And then fib of 3, like here's fib of 3 a bunch of times, twice. Fib of 3, and then fib of 3 again. So it's just redoing a lot of work. And it's kind of like doubling the amount of work every time you make a call. Like fib of 6, for example. Like imagine what fib of 6 would do. It would have to go off and call uh, fib of 5, and then add that to fib of 4, which is this whole thing copied over there. See how the work doubles every time you make an, a higher number? You give it to fib. Any questions about that? Because that's the problem here. Computing fib of n plus 1 is double as hard to compute than fib of n. So that's why 7 is fine. Computer can do that. 100, so much doubling. Like ridiculous amounts of doubling has happened that uh, it would never finish. Okay? That's the idea. That's the problem. There is a way to solve this repetition problem. It's just like, if I've calculated fib of 3 before, save the answer somewhere so that I don't have to like redo the whole work over here. There's a way to make this fast and normal uh, without well, keeping it recursive, uh, but you would have to wait until an algorithms class, or at least CSI like 26 or something, to learn more about that, alas. But yeah, that's Fibonacci. That's why uh, this way is a little bit naive, but it's a good example of, of like recursion with a bunch of base cases, a bunch of recursive cases, and uh, showing you some things that do not 
immediately seem uh, like they are possible. Any questions about this before I try some more? Here's a, an interesting example. It'll help get us practice with just the, the leap of faith that it takes to trust in the power of recursion. All right, I'll show you this. So let's make a function that prints from 1 to n, prints numbers from 1 to n, or n is the parameter in order, okay? So I'll call this, uh, yeah, I'll make a new file. But I want to make a function called print from 1 to and goes up to n. So if I were to call it, like, print from 1 to 5, that would, it's supposed to print this, right? It's supposed to print 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. And I claim this is a recursive problem. Do you see a smaller print from 1 to problem inside of this one? You see the next smaller one? It would be printing from 1 to 4. See that? There's your smaller problem that does the same thing. It's still printing from one to some number in order, right? And so that's your recursive case. It's just like, solve the smaller problem, make your recursive call, recursively print from one to n minus one. That's a smaller problem. You get to assume, just assume that that works and does the right thing. That's the magic of recursion. Just assume that does the right thing. Prints from one to four. And it really will work as long as you build up the answer correctly. And then you print your n. Because right? that's the last thing that the recursion didn't do for you. It printed everything up to u minus 1, and then you got to print yourself. All right? And then the base case, we have to like think about how small could this problem possibly get in that I don't have to do anything else. So like, let's try and break this down following our recursive case until it stops making sense. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that like the recursive call is going to print from 1 to 4, and then inside of that, the recursive call is going to print from 1 to 3, and then the 4, and this recursive call will print from 1 to 2. Then this one can print from 1 to 1. That could be a base case. Be like, if you want to print from 1 to 1, like just print 1 and be done with it. That works. But I think you could go even further than that and have a base case of like printing from 1 to 0, which doesn't make sense because that's a weird ordering. So like if, if n was 0 and you're trying to print from 1 to 0, there are no numbers between 1 and 0 in that order. So you can just print nothing at all. So that's another valid base case. And that one's easier, honestly. So let's do that. And that will be our first example. Recursive printing dot cdp. So I'll, I'll call uh, print from one to five, and that'll be my function. So print from one to uh, is void because it just prints and it takes a number that you want to print up to. So uh, you got to figure out: Are we in the base case or the recursive case? If n is zero, that's the base case. Do nothing. Just like immediately return or I'm just gonna have an empty body. Technically, I didn't even need this. Do nothing at all. Just let the function return else. Otherwise, we're in the recursive case. And uh, we want to recursively print from 1 to n minus 1. So that's a smaller problem, we just assume that works. And then we want to print our n because that was the last piece of the puzzle. Alright, so how do we recursively print from 1 to n minus 1? We call ourselves. Because we're supposed to be able to do that. We can assume that this smaller call works and does the right thing. And as long as we build up the right answer correctly by printing our n as well, it really will do the right thing. So I'm calling this print from 1 to 5. I got my answer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Cool. Any questions about this code? I'm going to draw a diagram right now, though which should hopefully help. So you have to believe in the recursion. You just get to assume that this is going to work. No extra time is necessary. It's so magical. So let's, let's watch uh, the stack unwind and let's see how it works, really. So main calls print from 1 to 5. I'll just call it p because that's easier for me to write. So main calls p of 5. And here's like our little output window. I got nothing, nothing output yet. P of 5 is like, all right, print from 1 to 5. All right, I will print from 1 to n minus 1. And once that's done, I'll print my 5. So it goes off and it calls P of 4. Which is like, all right, I'll print from 1 to 4 for you. But first, recursive case, I'll print from 1 to 3 recursively. And then I'll print my 4. I'll remember to do that after this is finished. So it goes off and it computes P of 3, which is supposed to print from 1 to 3. And then likewise, P of 3 calls P of 2 to print from 1 to 2. Again, we're still in the recursive case. Print from uh, P 
of two is going to be like, let's print from one to one, p of one, and then I'll print my two. And then p of one is still the recursive case, like I'll print from one to zero, and then I'll print my n, my one. So we eventually get to p of zero, that call. And then finally, 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 this is the base case. This returns, does nothing, just returns back to whoever was calling it. P of zero is done. P of one, it's like, all right, I was waiting on this, print from one to zero in the order, and then I got my n, right? And it's the parameter that's one. So I'm going to print my one now. It's ready. So there it goes, and it prints its one. And then everybody else was waiting on that line, too. It's like, all right, P of, one, P of two was waiting on this one. This call to finish, now it can print its two. And return. And then P of 3 was waiting on P of 2. It's finished. It's printing from 1 to 2. It did it. Now it can print its 3 and return. Now P of 4 can print its 4 and return. And then finally, we print it from 1 to 4. It's our job to print 5 now. Do that. Return back to main. We're done. Does that make a little bit of sense? That's how it's going to unwind, and that, that really is why it's going to work. This recursive case is going to work. You will get down to a base case and start building yourself back up. You can assume that this smaller call works, as long as you build up the bigger answer. How fun! All right. So uh, with that, here's my code. I want you to try. Let's put this here. I'll give you a little bit to think about this, but here is a problem for you. Try it. Come up with a recursive solution. If you, can, if you can code it up, go for it. If you can just write down the base case and the recursive case, that works too. Come up with a recursive problem, a recursive answer, that prints, or recursive function, that prints from 1 to n in reverse order. All right? So, to n down to 1, and I'll answer this for you. What does p of 5 look like for this particular problem? Printing from 5 to 1 downwards. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right? So it's in reverse order. Can you find the smaller problem? Can you see how that becomes the recursive call? How do you build up the bigger answer? It'll look a bit similar to this, but subtly different. So give that a try. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes. And do you have any questions about it? Give you some time to work. But at least come up with a base case. What is it not doing for you that you still need? No, no point. Reference. No, I think that would be evil. I think I promise no pointers.
All right, that was my timer, at least. Let's, let me try my answer, but at the very least, did we find the smaller recursive call? Where is where's problem size 4, which prints from 1 to 4 in reverse order? That's right here, right? And so there's a, honestly the only difference between this answer and this code is where, where you make the recursive call. You can mess this up and accidentally have it be reversed if you swap these two lines. Let me show that to you. It'll just become obvious from the, uh, from the answer. So this, if I just copy and paste this. Oop. That's like P of 5. Here's P of 4 in green, but the big one is P of 5. And so what's the strategy in the recursive case? It's all right. What do you got to do? You have to print from 4 to 1 in reverse order, but before that, right? Before that, you must print your 5 so it appears in that order. Does that make sense? So you got to print your n first. So that's your 5. That needs to appear in the first in the output. And then you print from 4 to 1 in reverse order. So that's the smaller problem. You print recursively from n minus 1 down to 1. And then again, your base case is like print from 0 to 1, or from 1 to 0 in reverse order, or something like that. But still, you can just do nothing. That will be another good base case. You could also be just print 1, base case, if n is 1. So honestly, the only difference between this answer and the other answer is the order in which we print our n and make the recursive call. That's the only difference. See? That one versus that one. And it just naturally comes out of what we have to do, right? We have to print ourselves and then make the smaller call. That's going to give us reversed order. Just get to assume that works. So it's really copy and paste. What do I want to call this? I'll call it uh, reverse print from 1, 2. Okay, so reverse print from 1, n minus 1. And... Just the order is different. It's all right. Recursive case. Recursively print from one to n minus one. Uh, it's n minus one to one now. All right. So that's your recursive case. Print your n. Print recursively from n minus one down to one. It's just the order of those two lines of the recursive case. So let, let's call that with a new line in between. And what do you know? We do get our 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But really, the only difference was those lines. Do you see it? Do you see it? How easy it is that you can mess this up. Just that, that versus this. One will give you reversed, one will give you not reversed. And it makes sense, given what you're assuming. You're like, assuming this is going to do the right thing, all right? How do I build up my answer? It's got to go before. It's got to go before. Any questions about that? All right, more examples, because that's that's how we learn recursion. It just needs a bunch of examples. Let's let's do one where we print the uh, characters of a string in uh, in order. All right, so let's see here. I want to do that. Yeah, I have a, a C plus plus string string in uh, in in normal order. Sorry, we can maybe do reverse in just a second. So all right. Well, let's figure this out. We got a string. We want to print it out. We want to print out every character of the string. S. Maybe the string is blah. There's my string. It's got those characters. And uh, the idea is we would like to see this output. We would like to see all the characters printed out. B, L, A, H, in that order. We need to find a smaller problem, right? Uh, in the recursive case. Let's think about the recursive case first. So, how are we going to break this down? We need to find a smaller string to print. Does that make sense? That would be a smaller problem. This is the problem of printing the characters of a string in order. The only way this is going to get smaller is if the string gets smaller. And so, where is a smaller string to print all the characters of? It's either here, right? There's a one smaller string, or here. Here's like a one smaller string. You can either chop off the first character or chop off the last character. Split it up into the first character and the rest, or the first characters and the last. Either way, you get a smaller string. 
let's do it the first way. Let's do it this way. So that, like, the LAH is the smaller string, and we can go off and we can print that recursively after we print our first character. So that's how we split up the string. But as long as you make it smaller in some way, you can come up with a recursive strategy. But this way works for that way. So print the first character, and then print the smaller string recursively. Just call your function, assume it's going to do the right thing. So there's multiple different recursive cases that work, but that's going to be how that works. Uh, and then the base case is like, when can I immediately print all the characters of a string and it's easy, right? So uh, you could think of like a size one string, one, one character to print, just print it, be done. Or, again, you can think about emptiness. Like, what? when do I just not have anything to print at all? When the string's empty. That works. So if you follow your recursive case, you'll come up with one or the other, one of those. I like the idea of emptiness. If the string is empty, you got no characters to print, so just do nothing. Good base case. I want to do nothing as, as often as I can, okay? And so, yeah. Otherwise, if we're in the recursive case, print the first character, and then call yourself on the smaller string. How do you do that, by the way? How do you calculate the smaller string? And chop off a character? It's going to be substr. If I go to the string type, if I have internet, come on. Well, other? What if I click here? I'm concerned for the website. All right, so we broke this website. It's okay. It's it's substr though. I I promise. If you say, take your string s. You say substr. Usually, like you give a starting index, and you give how much of characters you want after that. But if you just don't give the second thing, you just say s dot substr one. It will from this, and this is like your starting index. It will just take the rest of the string from that index onwards. That's the goal. And wow, this this website must be down right now, or my internet's down. One or the other. Oh, there it went. Cool. Are you happy now? Yeah, 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 there we go. So it's substr, wherever that is. There it is. Create a substring, and by default, as a default parameter of this for the length that you want. So starting from this position, get the get until the end if you don't give anything for this. All characters until the end of the string by default if you forget to give something here. That's the idea. We so yeah, let's do that. I'll call this print chars dot cpp, and I want to mess with strings, so I need a string library. Um, and then let's make my blah string string s, and then I'm gonna call print chars on s. That's the goal. So, all right, void print chars. If I can spell that. And then we're taking a string in. Taking a string in to print all the characters in reverse order. So string s, whatever you want to call it. But we're just, we're not going to mess with the string. We're going to just look at the character. So we'll, we'll take it by constant reference to save some space. So now, are we in the base case or the recursive case? So we've chosen the empty string for the base case. So if S is empty, then base case, you got to print all the characters in the empty string. There are no characters to print. Aha, uh -huh. so do nothing. Do nothing at all and then be done with it. Else, we're in the recursive case. And what we want to do is print the first character and then print the string that doesn't have the first character in it because that's smaller. We can do that recursively. So print the first character, and that's just like C out S at zero. It's always at the zeroth index if it's non-empty. And recursively print the smaller string. So I want to call print chars on a smaller string that is just like S dot substr one. I'll take everything from the first index onwards and make Size smaller string of everything but the first character. So then, when I call it, boop, I get my characters. Yay! Any questions about how this one works?
making enough sense. So, all right, try this. Uh, let's let's do a different one. Let's print the characters in reverse order. How would we do that? All right. So again, we have a string. The the base case is the same. You want to print all the characters in reverse of the empty string of. Let's, let's print every one of those zero characters in reverse order. Just do nothing again. But if we had this string, blah, we would like to print, I guess, halb this time, backwards, blah. And so we're going to split it up. We can split it up in the same way into the first character and the rest of the string. So where, like, this is the smaller string. Where is its recursive call? Where is the printing all of that characters in reverse order? It's right here. See how it happens first now? Gotta do that first, and then you can print your uh, your first character. So that's the recursive case. Recursively print the smaller string backwards because it has to appear first. Gotta see the howl before the b. And then the only thing that hasn't been printed so far is that one character that we have not yet considered. That's your b. If you print that, you have a correct recursive case. Base case will be the same. Empty string, do nothing. If you're printing in order or in reverse order, you've got nothing to print. So again, it's going to be this, but just reverse the body of the recursive case, pretty much. Print chars reverse. Print chars reverse. we got to do that first. Recursively print the smaller string in reverse. That's this call. And then print the first character. Nice. That's really it. That was what we noticed we needed to do, and so let's let's run it. And then we'll be like print chars reverse on s. And so running this code on the blah string again, we do get our halb. And notice that it's again so similar to the first one. In order, print your first character, print the rest of the string recursively, reverse it, oops, print the smaller string in reverse recursively, and then print the first character. That's what gives you reverseness. Because the name, this is just the name of the function, I can call them both f. Name doesn't matter. The order in which I do these things, that is the kicker. Any questions about any of that? It's a fun little idea. Let's see here. All right. I have a uh, problem for you now. You don't have to write this down anywhere. Just write it down with your with the people you're sitting next to and talk about it. But you don't have to submit this anywhere. But here is here's an algorithm I'd like you to come up with. All right. Write it in just pseudocode. It's not really going to work when you code it up for C, uh, for string types. But the idea is going to get you far. So let's say that we have a string. We have our blah again. And you can split it up in the same way, that's fine. We have your blah. Write a recursive algorithm to capitalize this string, to modify it and to capitalize it. Alright, that's your problem P. Alright, that's your problem P right there, capitalizing a string. So can you find a smaller string to capitalize? The goal is to re replace all these characters with capitals. Can you find a smaller string to capitalize. Where is that call? Is there an order in which you have to make it? But try to come up with the base case and the recursive case for taking a string and capitalizing it. Just write it in English, though. Write the steps that you would take. It won't quite translate into code very easily, but the idea is uh, is simple. All right, so try that. It's going to be similar to what we've been doing. Take a few minutes to think about that.
mode. All right. You could totally break down this string in the same way, like first character, rest of the string, but what's the base case? Have we come up with a base case? I'm going to capitalize a string. It's like a string that you can like immediately capitalize. We have very simple amounts of work to do or no work at all. Are we too confused? I think the empty string would work just fine again, right? Capitalize all the characters in an empty string. There's nothing to do. That could be your base case. Recursive case, though. Hoo-hoo. What do we got to do? Actually, the org's not going to matter since we're modifying the string. As long as we do everything. Oops. As long as we do everything by the end of this, we're good to go. But recursive case. What we want to do is, in some order... We have a smaller string to capitalize, yeah? And then we have the one character that was not part of that smaller string. It also must be capitalized. The order doesn't matter because this is void. We're not printing anything. So in some order, we want to capitalize the first character. And then, so that will make the capital B. And then we have to worry about the rest of the string. Capitalize everything else. That would be the job of the recursive call. We just get to assume that that works. Capitalize the rest of the string recursively. So that's how that will work. Um, you can't really do this very easily unless you pass along indices to your to your function. You make another parameter and give it more arguments when you call it. Uh, it does work like this, though. You just pass along the string if you're doing C strings. So let me show you that. Let's have a, uh, let's make an example where we capitalize uh, the contents of a C string, because that one really will work in the way that we just talked about. So let's say I have the C string blah, and remember that the C string blah has five characters, secretly. It's got the B, L, A, and the H still, but it's got that null terminator character that stops the string. That's going to be key here. Uh, let's see here, let's see. And then what we want to do is we would like to like split this up into the first character and the rest of the string. That's still easy. That's fine. And then eventually translate it into like replace the string with all caps, B-L-A-H. And keep it a C string, so keep the null terminator character. Right? So what we just came up with is going to work here. We can, in the recursive case, capitalize the first character, s of 0 or whatever, called two upper. And then we can recursively capitalize the smaller string by passing along the smaller string. So here's how this works. When you make a C string, it's really just a char star, right? This is not correct syntax, but it's morally correct. This will make sense in just a second. So if you make the string ABC, for example, and you, you can store that into a char star one way or another, what does that look like in memory? What does it mean to pass along S2, the string, the C string? It looks like this in memory, still A, B, C, null terminator. But if you pass along S2, that's just an address. It's just the address of the first character in the string. S2 is a pointer to that first character. So maybe this is address 100, this is address 101, 102. Yeah. That's the idea. S2 is holding 100. So how do you pass the smaller string that's just B, C, null terminator? you got to pass along address 101 which is S2 plus 1. If you pass to somebody S2 plus 1, do some uh, arithmetic on pointers, that will give you the B string starting there. You think of it as starting there. That's how you pass along the C string. So that's the goal. The C string is represented as a pointer to its first character, so the smaller string is S plus 1, whatever your S is. That's the thing. That's how this will work. Just pass that along to the smaller, to the recursive call. And then the base case is the empty string. When you have a string that, like, when do you have a string that you don't have to do anything for? Does it need anything capitalized? Just the empty string. And you'd notice that you'd have the empty string if your first character is the null terminator, because that must appear in every string, even the empty one. It's empty if that's the only thing there. Okay. And that is our strategy. Let us implement it. So...
Capitalize.cpp. Dun, dun, dun. And so I need, let's see, I need C string stuff. C string stuff. That would make it easier. I can call string length. And then CC type for two upper. So I got my, here's my C string, char s equals blah. Here's a C string blah now. And then I'll call capitalize on s. All right. And then print out the new version of s that got updated. So this is a void capitalize uh, recursive function. And it takes a C string, so it takes a char star, I'll call it stir, and it's taking C strings which is passed along as the address of their first character. So that's the whole string that I'm given right now initially. And now I gotta figure out am I in the base case or am I in the recursive case? If I'm in the base case, I got nothing to do. The empty string has no characters to capitalize. So if you can't check if the string length stir is equal to that, that's the C style syntax. Because we're trying to compare pointers, right? Stir is a pointer. It can't compare to the empty string. That makes no sense. So one way to check if it's empty is like check its zeroth character. Stir of zero is equal to null terminator. Or, which makes more sense when you read it later, you can just call stirlen. Stirlen on the string stir. If that's equal to zero, it's an empty string. Do nothing. Has no length. Base case, do nothing. Else, we're in the recursive case. And what can we do? Well, we must capitalize the first character of that string. That's the thing that the recursion doesn't deal with. So that's this guy. Capitalize it. So, stir of zero, capitalize that, equals two upper on whatever it was. And then, recursively, capitalize the smaller string. So, pass along this guy. Let the recursion take care of it. Assume it's going to work because it's a smaller string to call it. So capitalize, call it on the smaller string, that's stir plus one. That's the address of the second character in the string stir. And strings are represented by pointers to their first character. So I'm passing along the address of this next character, which makes a one smaller string. I'm passing along essentially this string here. All right? That's the goal. So we needed pointers before recursion slides. And that should do it. I get my all caps blah. And it would be very helpful if you drew, drew those diagrams like I've been drawn before for this. But are there any questions about the, the implementation? This is something to study for sure. I know it's a harder topic. So smaller string is S plus one. That's very important. Let me actually underline all of that. If you ever have to work with C strings recursively, Pointer arithmetic is your friend. All right. Uh, I have one last real main example that includes code, and it is the hardest example of the day. It is also a very good example of saying, why in the world would you ever use recursion? All right, because every problem that I've given you so far, like print from one to something in, re in order, or in reverse order, or capitalize stuff, those are all silly problems, right? You could use a loop easily, solve that problem. Like, why do we even care about trying this recursively? To teach you recursion is why I'm doing those. Here is a problem that you cannot solve with loops. All right? You would be hard-pressed to solve this with loops. It would not make any sense at all. This is going to make all the sense in recursion and in recursion using recursion only. All right? So here's the problem that you cannot do non-recursively. Scramble the characters of a word and print out every possibility. All right? This is something you might want to do if you're making, like, a word game. So, what I want to do is find every permutation of all the characters in a word, and I want to give back a vector of every option. That's going to be my, my problem right now, all right? So, for example, I'll make a function called perms. That's how it's going to be. It's going to take a string, and it's going to scramble every character in that string to make a bunch of different strings, and we're going to give back all of them as a vector. All right, so I'm going to call perms to compute all the permutations of the string ABC, let's say. So this will return, what I want to do is have this return all the different combinations, all the different permutations of these characters in this string. So I got the string ABC, the original one, of course. Then I also have the string ACB, right? That's another permutation of those characters. And I also have uh, BAC, if B comes first, it could be BAC or BCA, 
Or if C came first, it could be CAB or CBA. Those are your six permutations, three factorial, right? Those are your six permutations of all the characters in that string, and there's no way you could do that with a loop, all right? There's no way you could compute this with a loop. But it becomes very easy to compute this recursively, all right? So I'll show that to you. Uh, the problem is going to be like where we have to find a smaller word scrambling problem inside of the bigger word scrambling problems, like ABC, where's a smaller word, word scrambling problem inside of that. Uh, we'll, we'll think about that in just a second. But a base case is super easy. When do you have nothing to scramble? Like you can immediately give back an answer. Either you have a single uh, a string with a single character, size one, you can't do any scrambling, just give back that thing, or you're trying to scramble all the characters in the empty string. That's, that's another base case. So that's more generic, so we'll use the empty string as our base case. But here, here's that. It's just like, are you trying, if you are trying to scramble all the characters of an empty string, there's no characters to scramble. It's just the empty string is your final answer. So just give back a vector containing only the empty string. Whee, just like that. Or if you're trying to scramble a single character, just give back a vector containing just that single character. Either one of those is a valid base case, but this one is more generic. And I like that. So... That's the base case. And then here's the recursive case. I kind of spelled it out for you as I was drawing the answer. But the idea of permuting every character in the string, figuring out all the different jumblings of the word, you can break it down this way. You can break it down into what's the first character. Like, pick one of these to be the first character. Pick the A to be first, pick the B to come first, or pick the C to come first. And do you see how that makes a smaller string that you can scramble? Then, go off and scramble BC, because you got two options, right? BC and CB. And you'll get that back recursively. You get to assume that you do. That's the magic, all right? And then if you say that B is going to be your first character, you've made that choice. Then, just take every other character, you've made a smaller string, go off and scramble AC into AC and CA and shove B at the start. That'll be another scrambling. Then, if you pick C to come at the front, they all have to give it... Be, have a chance. Then you have AB, that's a smaller string to permute, compute all of its jumblings. You got AB and BA that are going to be given back to you by recursion. All right, so that's your recursive case. Pick a starting character, you have to try them all anyway, and then recursively scramble what's left. Like you pick that C must come first. Scramble a, the A and the B then to get uh, AB and BA, and then shove C at the start. That's what you're going to do. Recursively scramble the remaining characters and build up the result vector by taking those things together. Okay? Add that starting character that you chose. So you're going to give everybody an option, but let's say that we're choosing A to come first. So let's say right now we're choosing A. A comes at the, at the front of this jumbling. We've made that choice. So what we're going to do in the recursive case is we're going to scramble B and C, scramble the smaller str string, compute the permutations of the string bc. And we just get to assume that recursion does the right thing. It'll give us back the strings, a vector of strings bc and cb. That's the magic of recursion. And then we're just going to shove the a at the start of that to compute as our final answer, or as part of our answer, the string abc and acb. Okay? So this is a hard problem, I know, but this is such a good example of where you would need to reach for recursion. You could not do this with loops for arbitrary sized strings. So there's that, and let me program it for you. This is a great one to get used to and try and figure out, all right? Are there any questions before I go to code? It's going to be so cool. All right, so I need... I'll call it scramble.cpp. And I'm going to need strings, of course, and vectors. So here's, here's what it's going to look like, right? Here's the, the syntax. Here's the declaration of this function. Honestly, I can take it by constant reference, but that's beside the point. Uh, let's just do that anyway. Constant reference to the string s. I don't want to change it. Just want to use it. There. And so that's what it's going to look like. And so if I use it, here's how it would be. It'd be like, uh, 
uh, I want to compute the perms of ABC, and that will be giving me back a vector of strings of all the different permutations, call it V. And I want to print every one of those out, or every uh, string reference S and V, go and print it out after we've computed them. All right. But now the bulk of the work is going to go into this function. So I want to compute all the permutations of all the characters in this string S that was given to me. All right. I need to figure out, am I in the base case or am I in the recursive case? The base case is the empty string. You just give back a vector containing just the empty string. That's We've scrambled it. We're done. Nothing else to do. So if S is empty, then we're in the base case. So we got to give back a vector of strings still as our result, right? That's our, that's what we give back. So return type vector of string result. That's just the vector holding only the empty string, and that's what we return in the base case. Otherwise, we're in the recursive case. We are going to build up again a vector of strings, call it result, and give that back. Eventually, after some work, return result. But in between is where the magic happens. All right, what we got to do? We got to try every character to be the start, scramble the rest, and then bring that character back to the beginning and add this to our result vector. All right, so try every character and scramble the remaining characters. So let's watch this work. So I have to try every character as the start. I have to try A, B, and C. So I'm going to loop through every character of the string. I'm going to use indices. For int i equals 0, i is less than s dot size i plus plus. I'm giving, going through every index of s, and I'm pretending that that character at that index gets to be the starting character of my scrambled word. All right? So starting char equals whatever is at i. That's that. So I've made that choice now. I'm going to make everybody gets a chance, because we're going to try this loop everywhere. And then I need to make a string of remaining characters. Like, if I if I picked the B as the start, I need to compute the, the string AC, that's the rest. I need to chop off the B somehow to compute a smaller string that contains the remaining characters. So, how can I do that? String remaining characters. That's just S without that index, right? So I can erase. I can say S uh, remaining characters dot erase. That index I, at index I, one character. That would remove the starting character that we just chose. That's chopping off whatever is at i. That's beautiful. So now here's the smaller string. Like, if I just chose a, I chopped off the a just now, and I computed in the remaining character string, I computed bc. Now I want to scramble bc and get this back. All right? That's what the recursion will do for me. So I now have a smaller string in remaining characters that I can make a recursive call on. I can say perms on remaining characters. What does that do for me? That gives me all the jumblings of that smaller string. I get, I get to assume that works. Vector string, call it smaller string perms equals whatever that is. Alright, I got that. And then, for every one of them, maybe I just got back B, C, and C, V, I want to shove A at the start of those. Shove A at the start and then add that to my result vector. I'm building up every possibility with, with A coming first and B coming first. That's another round of this loop. And C coming first. So that's almost it. So for every, for every string, call it smaller string perm in smaller string perms, I'm going to take that string and then add the starting character to the beginning. That is a valid jumbling of everything now. Add starting to the front and put it in the result vector. So this is what I'm eventually going to give back, result. I just have found a one new string to add to it. Like maybe I'm going through this permutation thing and I got BC, I want to put the A at the front and push that. Or I have CB, I want to put the A in the front and push that. That will give me all my jumblings. So here's the new uh, permutation, that's your starting character that you made the choice for, plus the rest of that string, smaller string perm, whatever we're going through right now. And that is one of your results. Results uh, dot push back that string. 
And that, once we return it, we'll try every option. This is where the magic happens, this recursive call. It'll just go off. You get to assume it's going to give you all the permutations of that smaller string that you can shove the starting character to the front of. And I would not dream of drawing the diagram for this and how it works. You just got to believe in the magic of recursion. It really will scramble any size string that you give it. So let's watch it work. Whee! Scramble. I really do get back all my six answers. If I add, and this will work for any size string, this is why loops will not be how you solve this problem. It has to be recursion. Because you got 24 answers for this one. It's like, all right, either, and you can see how the recursion's working. Either A is coming first, and it's scrambling that smaller string, six options for that one. Or B is coming first, and it's scrambling the rest of that string, six options for that. Or C is coming first, you got the rest of the string to scramble. Or D is coming first, you got the rest of the string to scramble. But you just assume that the recursion is going to give you back all the rest of the characters scrambled, every option. You just put your starting character that you made the choice for at the beginning. And that's your answer. How fun. So that is, uh, that's this problem. That I honestly don't even know if I can show it to you all at once. <laughs> I'll zoom out a little bit. Almost. There's still a return result. There it is. There's the whole function. So this would be very nice to, to study and learn from. It's a great example of recursion. That is non-trivial and that you could never do this with a loop. Just a normal bunch of loops. All right. Magic in that recursive call. You just get to assume it's going to give you back the right amount of permutations. Any questions about that? So hopefully I've convinced you of the power of recursion. Uh, that's the last thing I want to code up, but before we go, before I give you your next lab, let's talk about this example. It's called the Tower of Hanoi. Have we heard of this problem before? It looks like this. You got a bunch of pegs, and it's just a game that you can play. This is a standard example of recursion. Something that will probably be in your textbook, uh, or on the internet if you want to search for it, but I don't, I don't feel like teaching it to you, because I think it's a bit... Uh, mm -hmm. It's overused, but here's the game. Like you got this, and you got all these things, and the goal is to move this entire stack of pegs all the way to over here. Like move it all over here in order. Uh, and the the rules are that you cannot put a bigger peg on top of a smaller peg. So you can't have something like this. You can't have like small thing then big thing above it. That's the only rule. And you can use this peg as like your intermediate stuff. Like your goal is to take from source the first peg, everything, off of there, and move them all to the destination peg, all right? Using this one as like an intermediate, intermediary, so like shove everything over there, and every time you move something, you cannot put things in the wrong order. So like if you take off the smallest peg and you put it here, you can't take the next bigger one and put it on top, because that would invalidate the rules, right? You'd have to, you'd be forced to put it over here, and then maybe you can put this one on top of that. Something like that, because then it's got the right order again. But there is a way for any size to just use two pegs and move the whole thing while following the orders, following the rules of the game. It's called the Tower of Hanoi problem, and it is not obvious how you would come up with how to do it, but there is a recursive answer, there's a recursive function that you could write that tells you every single move that you need to make to move all this stuff from here to here. That's the goal. And again, this is a good example of you could not use loops to solve this problem. You would have to use recursion. All right? So uh, I'm not going to test you on it. It's just a very classic example. Go, Feel free to look up like Tower of Hanoi recursion on the internet, and you will find so many YouTube videos. It'll be very fun. So I encourage that. But uh, here's the idea. The base case is very easy. Uh, it's like, when, when do you know you could always go from somewhere to somewhere else? Like, if you have a size one stack of stuff, you could always move it from here to wherever you want because it's always the smallest thing. Size 1 is always the smallest thing. So that's the goal. That's your base case. And then the recursive case, let me see if I can explain this well enough that you could code it. You can break down the stack of things into... Blue is kind of hard to see. You can break it down into a smaller stack and then the last thing. It's like we're breaking down everything else in recursion. This is how you could break it down. 
And then here is a smaller Tower of Hanoi problem. Do you see that? The smaller problem, because you can put anything on top of this big one, just leave it there. That's the goal. All right, so recursively, here's the recursive case. Recursively move that one smaller stack of disks from, not, from starting peg not all the way to dust. Move that whole stack from here to here. Move it to the intermediate peg. So then you have everything but the big one, right? Everything but the big one here. It'll tell you how to do that, the recursion, the magic of it. I'm sorry, I cannot draw gradually decreasing pegs very easily. So you got that guy. And then the idea is, all right, that frees up this peg. It's at the bottom now once you did that recursive move of all those things. Then take this guy, move it over here. And then now you got this peg completely empty. Got everything else and this one. And then recursively again, you have this thing. It's a smaller peg, smaller Tower of Hanoi problem. Take all of this, recursively move it onto here, but use the source peg as the intermediate. That's it. That's the recursion. That's the beauty of it. And you could write a program that tells you, right, move pegs, move the peg at this block to this other peg. Just It would tell you exactly how to play this game and, and do it and solve it perfectly. And you could not use loops for this. It makes no sense to use loops, but it makes all the sense in the world to use recursion. So feel free to look up this problem if it's not already in your book. That's a good example. Any questions about that? All right, yeah, I would I would get my computer science license taken away if I didn't tell you about this problem when I taught recursion. But I'm not going to teach it to you yourself. Uh, uh, you can learn it yourself. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Let me show you. Your next lab will be due in two weeks, so you got time. Just deal with the, the midterm for the rest of this week. It'll be fine. Uh, but here is your next lab. Oh, yeah, make sure to do attendance. I'm going to stop that right after I finish all this. Here is your next lab that wants to load. Lab 8. This one's about files. So files were not too hard, right? So this is a nice breath of fresh air after, after the midterm. So let's get out of this. Go to start a code. It'll take forever to load. Give it a second. This one's about files. Here are all the things that I'm giving to you. And there's a couple parts. But I have some sample files, of course. One of which is the entire works of Shakespeare. Why not? So here is your first uh, problem. Let's see here. How was I going to do this? So files. Here is your first problem. I would like you to count a specific word in the complete works of Shakespeare. All right? For this this one is going to be countwords.cpp. It's going to take two command line arguments. You're going to run it like this. And you're going to give it a file name. Or you're going to give it a word that you want to search for in that file. And it can have any any kind of capitalization. It doesn't matter. All right? You're going to be fixing that in just a second. So countwords.cpp. You're going to be getting through argc and argv. Oh, gosh. What, is, what in the world is going on here? Oh, uh, let me try that again. <laughs> it's a little weird. There, okay, now it's happy. So you're going to be getting uh, two command line arguments, so you're going to have to use those. The file is an argv of one, and then the string to search for is an argv of two, and you're going to count how many times you see that string in the file. It's going to read every uh, read every word of the file and track how many times you see that string. Uh, with the caveat of, if you see, like, this is apparently how many times Shakespeare says thou in, in his works. The caveat is, you want you need to search for this string anywhere in the sentence. So it could be at the end of the sentence, and so you'd see the word thou period. You want to count that. Or it's the start of a sentence. You see capital thou. You want to count that. Okay? Does that make sense? So you're gonna have to fix up every word that you read. Uh, and I've made a fixed string function that will help. So like use this function to replace the string that you give it. It's gonna take it by reference, but take it and transform it into like a cleaned up version that's lowercase. Because then you can just keep searching for that one. All right? So this is a function that will help you. Uh, just have it convert a string to lowercase and remove anything that is non-alphabetic. Like, for example, it will turn the period into just the. It will turn exclamation point the, all caps the, zero the, with weird capitalization, into just have it turn it into the string the. You kind of see how you would do that? So mess with the string, 
get it normal so you can just count it that way. Like everything's lowercase, there's no punctuation capitalization. Then you can compare and really get how many thes you saw. All right, that's the goal. So you, you go through the file, open it up, fix all the strings that you read, and then also fix the string that you were given to search for. So like all caps the, just count that as lowercase the, fix it up and count how many times it appears. All right, that's the goal. So are there any questions about that program? Read the file, count the words, after fixing up all the words? You want to count it if it's at the end of the sentence, and you would read a punctuation character. You want to get rid of that. So that it counts. That's that one. Uh, and then for the second part of your lab, uh, I made a silly program that kind of models an, an Etch-a-Sketch. Have we all seen these before? Like, this is part of my childhood. I hope they're still, still a thing. Like, you turn these knobs, and it draws little lines on the screen, and you can shake it. So I've made a library for you to just use. All right, it's called Etch-a-Sketch library. I've made these files for you already. You do not have to change them. So I've made etch-a-sketch.h and etch-a-sketch.cpp. You don't even have to look at the .cpp since I'm uh, I'm just having you use the library. Here's the here's the header file though. An Etch-a-Sketch object takes as its constructor a character that it wants to make drawings with. It's so like I'll draw with stars by default, but you can change that. And then you tell the Etch-a-Sketch there's no knobs. You say, I want to go left, I want to go right, I want to go up and go down, right? And that moves it in that direction. It starts building up a giant two-dimensional grid of characters that is your string. You don't have to care about that uh, because you are the user. You're just using the public stuff. You just use the get artwork method to get the pretty picture that you built up, and it will give you a string back at that, uh, at that point. But if you'd like, you can go into the implementation and see how I'm doing it. I'm doing some fancy class stuff but you don't even have to look at the CPP file. You're just using the library. It's an example of you using somebody else's library. All right, that's the goal. Uh, so that's, that's that. What you're going to do is you're going to implement this file that uses the library. It's called readanddraw.cpp. So this is where you're going to be working for this part of the lab. What you will do is, again, you're getting an input file from the command line arguments. And each file that you're going to be giving, I've made a, a few copy examples, input 0, input 1, input 2, .txt. They all look like this. They're all a file. They're all files with some commands. R for right, U for up, L for left, D for down. So you're going to use those. Input 1 draws this. One of them, like, I, I try to make it pretty. Like, one of them draws a house. One of them draws like, just a box. One of them draws, I forget. But... You see how you would read this file and just like run it through an Etch-a-Sketch object? Like when you see an L, make it go left. When you see an R, make it go right. Stuff like that. That's what you're going to do. Read every character of this file. And command an Etch-a-Sketch object using what the file is saying to do. It's like a, it's a, it's a blueprint. So open the file, create an Etch-a-Sketch object, read every character of the file, and move. Like if you see an L, make the object move left. If you see an R, make it move right. And then the Etch-a-Sketch object has a method that gives you back the artwork. Use it and print it out. It's really not that hard once you get uh, the ideas in your head. And then, for example, like, here's input1.txt. It draws high, apparently. It builds up high. And that's like, here are the instructions to the Etch-a-Sketch. This apparently will draw high, and I made that a while ago. So it's kind of fun. Input1 is that. Input2 is like a house or something. But that's the idea. And you're just going to read every file. Uh, every character and run it through this object. Any questions about that? So, just reading from files. Not actually having you write to any files in this lab. So, just reading. That's more common. And that's that. And then what you'll be turning in is the two parts. You're going to be, uh, you're messing with countwords.cpp and then the read and draw.cpp file. And so, those are the two things that you will turn in. Okay. So, that is your lab 8. Any questions about that? All right, that's all that I have for you. So let me attempt to stop this recording.